Hi guys, so you're going to talk about complex functions, especially complex branches, so let's get started. So what you should know beforehand is basics of complex numbers. This formula is equal to re to the i theta, which I'll explain briefly. So you see here we have this theta, in this case it's a phi, um, and you have e to the i phi is cosine of phi plus i sine of phi. It's called Euler's formula, or Euler's formula if you like. So as you see, we have a real and imaginary two-dimensional plane, right? And you have a point on the unit circle represented by this vector. In polar coordinates, you'd have this be r cos theta, r sine theta, but instead, instead of using the unit vectors which are orthogonal, x hat and y hat, we use i and you know one, these imaginary and real units, which are also orthogonal in this representation. You can see this corresponds to y and this corresponds to x. We can also do the computation of what the value of e to the i phi is. For example, phi equals zero, you'll just get e to the i is zero, cosine of zero is one, i sine of zero is zero, so that's just one which, as we can see, does make sense. So first, let's start with poles and zeros. A zero is pretty straightforward, just when the function is zero. A pole is when the denominator is zero, it just blows up like this. Uh, sorry, I should say this has a pole. Pole. So the order of a zero is multiplicity. The order of a pole is given by this residue formula. So what you do is you plug in this function f of z at the point you want to find the pole and you see what the lowest n is, at least one, such that this is an infinity or indeterminate point. So in this case, for example, you want to find the pole of two, right? You plug in um, n equals one, this is no factorial, this is no derivatives, and that's just z minus two, one over z minus two, it's just one. So since it's something reasonable, you know the order of the pole is one, in fact. So branches, that's the next kind of singularity you want to talk about, right? So they're like the vertical line test for x, y planes. If you have a function or not a function, you want to find out if it's a function. You do a vertical line test to see if it's a function or not. And this one will fail because it hits twice, right? It's two points. So the problem is in the z equals re to the i theta, you might not have the same analogy because there's a z axis that's not really on the plane. You have r. You can check if r goes around itself twice, but you can see um, that's not quite the strong enough condition. So actually, um, you want to make sure a function is single value. This is what this test is saying, but the test of the complex plane is what we're looking for. So if a function is not single valued, like in this case, um, like in this function here, then we say it has multiple branches. So here's an example, square root of z. This is the positive square root, let's note. So f of one is one, right? But f of one e to the two i pi and e to the two i pi is the same as just one. We can just do cosine plus i sine. And then you take the square root of that term by term, square root of one is one, square root of e to the two i pi is e to the i pi, but this is minus one. So this just picked up a negative, even though it's supposed to have a positive square root. And you see there's two different values. It's not single value, there's ambiguity, right? So we have two different branches of this function. So why is that? It's because we have branch points. So a branch point is a point you go around to switch branches of the function. So you often make up a factor like minus one or something else. In the previous example, zero was a branch point of the square root function. And why is that, right? It's because there's no sign freedom at zero. So like if you have square root of z equals to y, you know, some y of z, then y squared equals to z, right? And then you have this ambiguity as to the plus or minus square root of z satisfying this, but it's zero, there's no ambiguity. z is zero, then y squared is zero as well. So since it's the only point there's no ambiguity, it's the point that you use to switch between branches. So zero and infinity are the most common branch points. And a branch point at infinity, I said we go around branch points to switch branches, right? So what does that mean to go around infinity? The answer is just don't worry about it, but it'll tell us how we need to structure our function. It's easy to check, though, if you have a branch point infinity. And instead of checking if z has a branch point infinity, you just check if 1 over z is a branch point at 0. So if it does, then you have a branch point infinity. So if you have square root of z, then you have 1 over square root of w, right? And since you pick up a sign from going around the square root of something at 0, then, of course, you pick up a sign here as well, just in the denominator. So this is also a branch point of the square root of z function. Sorry, w equals zero is a branch point, which means that infinity is a branch point of square root of z. So 
the now we know how to find out whether our function is single valued. How do we fix it, right? The answer is we use branch cuts. So if you have this branch point at zero, you want to make it so you can't go around this branch point, or you can only make go around it in pairs. In this case, the square root, which cancel. So in this case, if you go around two of them and pick up two factors of minus one, and so that's perfectly fine because you've just done nothing, right? It's the same thing as kind of extending the domain of the function to be 4 pi in theta instead of 2 pi in theta. So what we do is we find the branch points and we designate a branch cut between them, which is a forbidden region. So here's an example for ln. So for ln, you have z equals re to the i theta, and you just use log props, you separate it like this, right? So what happens is first you have to find the branch points. Um, and we can see immediately, every time you go around by theta equals 2 pi, we'll add a factor of 2 pi i to the function, so it's not single value, even though, you know, yeah, it's not single value. So that's the problem. The branch points, first of all, 0 is a branch point, and how do we know that? We know that because ln of r equals 0 is pretty clearly minus infinity, right? So no matter what you add on here, you're not going to get anything to affect the overall function. So it's not affected really by these things, so it's a branch point z equals infinity is also a branch point because ln of 1 over z is just negative ln of z. So it has the same set of branch points as the other function does. So since that's a branch point, we have two branch points here and here. You want to make it so you can't go around any of them because in this case, if you go around two branch points, you're not going to cancel out. So we have a branch cut between 0 and infinity and this way, you know, um, if you want to do a contour integral, you have to do this weird like T-shaped contour where you're going around both of these branch, uh, neither of these branch points, I should say. You're going around the branch cut. So the forbidden region is this region on the real axis. So what this is called is creating Riemann sheets. So you can see here the square root of z domain. So the top sheet corresponds to two pi radians because you can go around it all the way. Bottom sheet does as well. So what happens is you can see from this picture, you start in the top sheet, the positive sheet as we call it, and if you go all the way around, you'll end up in a negative sheet, which is like how you pick up a sign, right? Because you went around zero. You've gone through the branch cut, and you ended up in a different sheet. So, um, key point is if you go around again, because of how these sheets are drawn, you'll be back in the same sheet you started with, which reflects how when we take the two factors of minus one, they cancel out, and you get back to the original function. So that's cool. The geometry represents kind of the algebra that's going on here. And if you have the, this one, this is for the ln, which we said it does not have, you know, this, um, this canceling out, this uh, 4 pi domain, which corresponds to two sheets of 2 pi. Instead, if you, you just keep adding on factors of 2 pi going around branch, uh, branch points into different Riemann sheets, you just keep adding on 2 pi i, 2 pi i forever. It's going to go deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole. And the only way back out is just coming up the way you came. So you can see that this geometry kind of exemplifies what's going on in the function. So there are infinitely many sheets. The domain is infinite in theta, not just 4 pi. Um, and that's really what's going on here. Instead of plus minus sheets, we have 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, so on, even in the negatives. So that's the, domain, the geometry of these Riemann sheets. So you might be wondering, what are these really useful for, right? Since we already have to know the domain of the function to kind of create these. The answer is, is if we analyze, um, suppose a physical system, like a resonant cavity, which has two resonant frequencies. One of them maybe is physical, one of them is not physical. If we examine the function that is creating the resonance, we can sometimes determine, for example, if the resonance is coming in pairs, um, which one is on the positive sheet, which one's on the negative sheet. And one of those may be unphysical, is because a minus resonant frequency might not be viable in the system we're studying. So this helps us categorize what solutions to our system in some cases may be physical or non-physical. So I hope that gives you an overview of these things. Next time we'll talk about complex contour integrations, and I hope you enjoyed the video.